I am the oldest of 12 kids. I was raised homeschooled and when I was around 16, 16, started performing with my family. My dad kind of urged us that way. I was in that environment till I was 24. We were on TV and there are a lot of kind of happy, beautiful things on the outside, but they're going all the way back to the beginning with some like really toxic threads throughout the story as well. My dad was really abusive from my very earliest memories. And if you can think of a type of abuse, that was probably on the table. He was sexually abusive. He became violent, especially towards the end, physically abusive. There's a, in some sense, carry more shame around and is still so confusing is at 23, my, I was being accused of being possessed by a demon for wanting to leave the house. I was being made into the problem. Like my dad, who now in the story, we understand he's convicted, did these things. He pled guilty to these things, but go back just a couple chapters earlier in the story, dad was not being talked about as the problem. I was being talked about as the problem. Welcome to the Good Grief, Good God Show, hosted by Grammy nominee and Emmy award-winning hit songwriter of 15 top 10 songs, including nine number ones, Brad Warren of the Warren Brothers. Join Brad during season one monthly on the first and third Tuesdays on your favorite audio platform or in video on YouTube for raw, honest conversation about surviving things that suck. For today's episode, Brad welcomes a singer-songwriter and author of a best-selling memoir, Unspeakable, Surviving My Childhood and Finding My Voice, Jessica Willis Fisher. Jessica is the eldest of 14 siblings of the Willis family. The family rocketed to fame after appearing in America's Got Talent in 2014 and after two seasons on TLC's reality show, The Willis Clan. But behind the curtain of fame was a controlling, abusive, violent, and domineering father who is now serving a prison sentence of 40 years on four counts of child rape. In addition to her book, Jessica also recently released Brand New Day, her debut record. I'm producer Matt Pivito. To learn more about today's guest, Brad, and the show, check the description where you'll also find clickable links to connect to the show on social media and to visit goodgriefgoodgodshow.com. Lastly, if you'd like to help support the show, hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a comment or a five-star review. On the behalf of Brad's wife, Michelle, and segment producer and guest booker, Lisa Bolt, thank you for tuning in. The Good Grief, Good God Show is brought to you in loving memory of Sage Michael Warren. <laughs> the well-placed Kleenex. I love it. Where's the well-placed Kleenex? Right here. Oh, <laughs> did you do that? Look at you. We did a Jesus Calling before we ever thought of doing a podcast, but right after our son died, and they came here and did an interview with my brother and I, and um, Lisa and my wife were both sitting here. I'm facing them. I would have been fine, but they're both bawling. I'm like, oh. And I, so I start crying. I'm like, I can't see my wife crying and not get something. So yeah. it like completely ruined me. I'm like, yeah, when we do this podcast, I'm facing them that way. <laughs> I don't want to see them. I don't mind hearing you. Yeah, but you... A couple times I thought you guys were laughing and you're, look at these uh, little handy things you got going here, Matt. I don't know what it is, but it's serious business. Is that your own shit, Mike? No shit. Do you go by Jessica Willis Fisher now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, yeah. Even like in, in your book, is that what your, your author is? Yeah. That's like my public yeah. name. I did the, the old married name change. Um, we got married in 2017. So I know you're not allowed, I'm just, so I'm not even going to do it because you can't ask a girl how old she is, but you're a little older than you look. I'm about to turn 31. I don't know. How old do I look? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah I th at first, I was like, she's like 23 years old. Yeah. You look well, really young, which is good. I'm having to deal with the thing of like, you know, the last time I was on camera so much and everything, I was like 24. So it's like, why don't I look like, you know, other people aren't seeing it, but I've, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm not 24 anymore. It's like, no. <laughs> My wife is 52. And, and occasionally we'll get, she'll get a, uh, you're what? Yeah. You you're know, what? my mom throws off. I'd be like, no, you're my mom's age. My mom is like 52. But in my, in my mind, mom is like, I go, well, she can't be 30 because I'm 30. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That start would be realizing. Uh, yeah. I was like, mom, you have screwed up my, my age calculator very badly because I, I, yeah, I can't guess young, anybody's right? age. I mean, certainly yeah, I think she looks really young. People think we're sisters all the time. It's I think the looking alike thing is just more exaggerated whenever you see a large group of people that look the, like any family that has eight people in it, 10 people, 14 people in it, you know, it really, the genes hit you between the eyes. You're like, okay, I see all yeah. of the variety of... Six little boys <laughs> that kind of look exactly, yeah. We, yeah. we have 
um, not only a few f- friends, but like my, I have a niece that's her. She married a guy from a family of like eleven kids, mm-hmm. and they now have five kids in the last five years. Right? Wow. Five years, five kids in five years. And um, I think her uterus is begging for mercy at the moment. But but you could tell it's gonna be one of those huge families, and it is that kind of thing mm-hmm. where you don't ever want to get in line behind them anywhere. <laughs> Or like like always at the airport, if you see 20 people wearing the same t-shirt at the airport. Well, normally it's a family reunion. People. Yeah. But like for us, it was just the siblings, you know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's true. You would think it's yeah. about cousins. Exactly. Where where were you? Where are you where are you from? Like where were you born? So I was Where's... born in Chicago and then we moved to the Nashville area when I was nine. Okay. There were six kids at that time. So there were six kids born in Chicago and six kids born in the Nashville area. I wouldn't have thought Chicago from your story. It sounds like more like West Virginia or something. The biggest takeaway from Chicago was a strong Irish um, heritage. So Southside Irish is a big deal. We did Irish dance. We did Irish music. And so that actually was the foundation of all of my musical. Because yeah, I was thinking more bluegrassy, but I guess it's. it's That's the weird it's thing funny. is people it's, think it's, yeah. that we play bluegrass. And I actually would not call myself a bluegrass player ever. Full stop. Well, just the instrumentation <laughs> to just a regular commercial hack like myself would say, oh, it's bluegrassy. Well, if you see fiddle, you see, yeah. you know, a banjo or guitar, you know, stuff like that. But um, it was the button accordion and the Ellen pipes and the whistle that people were like, what are those? And it's like, those are the Irish instruments. <laughs> Did you ever hear the joke about the banjo player and the accordion player that played so the New Year's Eve gig? Do you know I, that one? I was the, like, the main speaker and stuff in the band. And I look back on a lot of things and just cringe. But um, there was... One of our longest running tropes was like the fiddle versus the accordion versus the banjo on on stage. So I don't know that I've heard the the New. Year's well, you'll like this, and I think it's pretty good. A banjo player and accordion player get a New Year's Eve gig, and they play all night. And the owner of the club is like, "That was amazing. You guys are so awesome. The people loved them. It was great." And they said, "Man, that was so great. Can you play again next New Year's Eve?" And and the banjo and the accordion player said, "Yeah, absolutely. Can we leave our stuff set up?" <laughs> We would always like say. Like they didn't have any other gigs. You got. You we would that? say. Everyone get that? Is that not funny? <laughs> no, no. We would say. I'm trying to think of what. See, they're all escaping me now. Um, what was my favorite one that I would always say? There was one about throwing out the accordion, but then when it. In the dumpster, it hits the banjo. There was something about. That was like the. Folks about running over an accordion that keeps playing. Yeah, that's probably. You probably got a lot of them. What, what all instruments do you play? I'm the person who plays like the least amount of instruments in the family. I play fiddle, which is my main instrument. That's the only one I'll really cop up to. I play some guitar and some fiddle just to like write songs and stuff. Um, But that's really it. (laughs) So Just fiddle and guitar because fiddle is like the hardest instrument ever to play. Well, that was the other thing is like everybody would be like, the accordion is so hard to play. It's like, no, fiddle, fiddle is the one where pitch, tone, everything depends on you all the time. And, you know, piano is a great instrument to start kids on whistle there's a lot of like basic don't give a kid an instrument that requires them to do tone and pitch right out of the gate because it just sounds like a dying cat for the first oh years it's painful (laughs) it is so painful my brother learned to play harmonica while we were gigging like at shows but i mean before we moved to nashville but we were playing just like trial and error four hours he's just kind of he's just trying to play in the key that it's in i don't know if you know anything about harmonica you have to have it's similar to an accordion right so if you're gonna play blues right right and it's got to be like the five a diatonic of, instrument, right, right? Right. Yes. So he was fit, but he he was. You could just blow into it in a key that it's in, and it's that straight heart Bob Dylan thing that almost. It's like playing Dad Gad when you're in D. You're right, like, I'm right, good. exactly, exactly. You're good. <laughs> but to, to play blues harp or cross harp, you had to be in a, a different key, and he hadn't. No one had taught him to figure it out, but he knew it was in a different key, and he was just trying it. And it was so painful. Well, there's, not, there's like making, nothing you could do. Not, he's, <laughs> he's trying to bend the notes in the right key that he was in. It was so horrible. And then I remember when he had a conversation with somebody. And the first night he picked up that thing and I'm like, oh God, here we go. And he started playing. I'm like, oh my God, he's good. He got it. It's like the kid learned how to swim that stopped going to the bottom of the pool. But yeah, it was. It's a, it makes me think of a kid learning how to play fiddle. It's just, if your finger's just the tiniest bit not right, you're, it's, it's like hearing a cat get hit by a car, I'm sure. It's, um, it's pretty bad. <laughs> how, old, how old were you when you started playing? I started playing when I was around eight or nine, right when we were leaving town is when um, we started off with the Irish dance first. Um, it was like four, three or four, I think, when that started. And then um, because of that, our dance teacher had said, 
you need to understand how the dance fits into the culture as a whole. So she had us go to the local Chicago Irish Fest and we saw these bands and we just fell in love with the energy of it and all these different instruments and knowing these little dance steps, like this was such fun music for us to dance to. So we came home with the CDs of like the top three or four bands at that festival and just wore them out. Um, when you say we, you and your parents and your siblings, you all fell in love with Irish music? So, I mean, yes and no. We, I would say some of the the breakdown of that is both of my parents played music. My mom played guitar and sang with her sister in church growing up. My dad played piano. He was sometimes with piano for church. He would sing hymns and harmonies with his family and stuff. So they both had that. Um, neither of them had ever done anything professionally with it. Dad would also compose some. So I think that was really important for me to have someone like in the home. Make, composing isn't just something that other people do. You can make up music and it can be in our mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my extended family did some sort of music as well. Um, my mom has pretty strong Irish heritage. It wasn't super emphasized until after we got into Irish dance and like grandma goes, you know, your grandfather was 100% Irish. And it's like, oh, <laughs> we should reconnect with family. And we have, like we have family in um, County Mayo in Ireland. But um, the other element was we were homeschooled and we didn't have any other like extracurricular sports or anything. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a wrestler and he was like, I'm gonna have 12 sons and they're all gonna wrestle. But then he had three, Three of his first four kids were girls. So um, we got into Irish dancing when they saw river dance. And he was like, that's cool. And there's all these schools around here that teach Irish dance. So that that was our gateway. And my brother, Jared, was really talented in music and really talented in dance. And I don't know that we would have ever been pushed to go in the direction that we were pushed if he hadn't shown that really hmm. strong talent. Are you the so, oldest, oldest? I'm the oldest. And then my, my brother, Jared. <clears throat> is less than a year younger than me. So okay. we're Irish, Irish twins. <laughs> so, I mean, Irish yeah. twins, yeah. I mean, you really yes. it's all the, hit all the stereotypes. Yeah. And then Except every... we're not Catholic. That's That was the thing. We got asked if we were Catholic all the time because so much of the Irish culture has been carried on by um, Catholics and like that's all mixed in there. So See, I, I'm Southern Baptist, but charismatic growing up. I mean, actually, I'm Catholic now, but whatever. Oh, okay. I'm not sure, yeah, whatever that is. But I grew up Southern Baptist. Uh, with and and there was a actually my nephew that I'm very close to is his wife I'm very close to is is from a family that we grew up with as parents and they had they have ten kids. Um, so would you know like a lot of families? So we had a few. There was and, and there is a thing to that. It's always been that. You, you, by the way, you have to drive the like Ford van. There's no other way to get everyone around. Like, we we had the black van. Like. All the families was that we cool? knew had the white bands, yeah, so we were yeah. like, we're the black man. We're, yeah, we're the cool man. <laughs> there's no other, I mean, an, an excursion is not going to cut it when you have no. 11 kids. Or it whatever, was so. an 18, I'm 16, 18, 16, Pastor. 18 sounds stupid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and then my niece is married to a guy that comes from a family of like 11, and he, they already have, they're the ones, they have like five kids in like five years, they're, they're going to have 15 kids if, 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 if they don't figure out how to use a birth control um but so i do know a few families like that and i always it's just like what is that like and you know when it's a healthy thing they usually say i wouldn't i wouldn't grow up any other way but it is um it is different did you feel yeah did you feel left out because you weren't going to school so one of my biggest things that i would change if i could is i would have loved to pursue a, a totally different education. I also think I am following through with um, continuing with some of the things that my unique education provided me with. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. I certainly would love to um, think outside the box and, you know, there's no reason I can't pursue more education if I want to. Um, but I don't have, like, I don't have a GED or, or anything. So it was very kind of off grid. Um, and definitely had some strengths and weaknesses. I felt left out. Um, I knew I was way above certain kind of standards in certain areas. Like I read Lord of the Rings when I was like nine. So reading mm -hmm. a lot really early on and I've continued to do that all throughout my life. Um, but I just like last year really wanted to get my GED, got one of the books and opened it to the math section. And the first page was so disheartening for me because I looked at it and I went, I don't, I've never heard this concept before. So it was, you know, it's a, it's a struggle. So did you just not learn math? Um, no, we did a whole structure. Math was actually one of the only topics um, 
It's not the word I'm looking for. Subjects. Subjects yeah. that we did a structured like curriculum for. A lot of the other things were not. My mom would do unique things, sometimes different for the different kids. But math, we just did like the work workbook situation. Um, and it I did not take to it and um and just struggled with it sounds like what you would want to hear, but it was like, oh, you don't need to learn this. And it was like, but just the fear of like not having kind of the normal, um, the normal, what everybody else is learning. Foundation. Foundation, yeah. Yeah, because I, I didn't even think about that educationally. I was kind of thinking more socially because all I ever thought of was get me out of here and get me to summertime or get me out of here at three o'clock so I can go. But I never really thought about am I getting a good or bad education. Well, well, that's funny because when I talk to other people, like they're like literally nobody loved school. And I was like, but I loved school. I wanted to go to school. So it's like a kind of backwards thing. And there also was a time I was such a little disciple of my family and particularly of my dad. He was the one who would push the more strange kind of beliefs or specific philosophies. And, you know, it got to where he had some specific teaching in every single area of life, whether it was how clothes were constructed or what subjects were taught in school or the philosophy for whatever, um, what have you. And I ingested that and was indoctrinated with a lot of that to where I would be, you know, 10 or 11 and I would meet peers and I would look at them and kind of evaluate them with my dad's eyes. And so I'm being told you're better than them. Their parents aren't raising them the way they should. And so I would want to go, what's your favorite book? And they go, I don't like to read. And I'd be like, oh, your parents are doing such a bad job with you. Like, you know, I'm almost like judgmental to my own peers. Well, well yeah. desperately wanting to have connections and friends and all of that, but also, you know, something that's going to stand in your way is when you feel other and superior and inferior all at the same time. And that's just keeps you from connecting with people. <laughs> I, 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 I relate in the strangest of ways. I, I come from a family of six, so four kids and two parents, which is a little bigger than average. And we went to a church where we did know families with the huge families. And then we had a private school that started at the church. Uh, and it, we did these like life packs and you taught yourself on your own. It's kind of a workbook thing, probably something like you were hmm. going through. And then we didn't have any television at all growing up. And and Most our parents were very, I had great parents and nothing bad to say, but we were very, uh, this is good and this is bad. And those people are doing a bad job if they're not doing this. And you should be, you, my dad would be like, you don't change your own oil in your car? What? My, that guy's a sissy because he doesn't change his own oil. Or you don't hunt or, you know, it's a very strange thing. And um, when I got a little bit older and I drove by a Jiffy Lube and it said oil change $14.99. I was like, what? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? I'm getting my whole body greased up every time like, to I'll, change I'll oil $14.99. Are you I, so there's some of those things that we I think that we tend to all grow up, but when our parents are adamant about something, we become adamant about them because that's all we know. We can. Yeah. And <clears throat> I still I, carry some of those things. Yeah. And I'll have conversations with my husband, for example, and I think that's an interesting distinction because you were saying, oh, I resonate, and the way you summed it up was, there's one way and we're it. And I think that that's the big divider. Whatever the specifics are, they're going to be different no matter where you're at. Like, if there's a core religion, um, if there's a core um, demographic or just things like that, culture that you're passed down, but... When I talk with my husband, I was like, were you told that there's the way we do it and it's right and everybody else is wrong? He was like, no. And I was like, okay, well then- That's why you're helping. <laughs> that's what's so different about this. With, again, whether it be a religious thing or not, because he was exposed to religion, but he wasn't told that his religion was like the right way. Whereas for me, I would say there was a religious attitude way beyond what happened in church. It was, again, like all these other things, definitely education and- the arts and the way you're supposed to pursue relationships and all of those things. And it was all under the banner of, if you step out of this, you're wrong. Um, that's not who we are. Um, using the voice of God and saying to other people, like, they're a nice person, but, and there was just long laundry list of all the ways that everyone else was wrong. I relate to that. And I don't think mine, mine obviously didn't get as out of whack, but I relate to that a lot. And that is a problem. That's a problem for with the church for me, is that we have to be right about everything. And to change them, I mean, I had some good family, friends, Christian people, whatever, I would rather die than change their mind about something. <clears throat> um, 
I think it's tough because I think that that actually is, in some ways, a very hard thing to compete with. So being raised in one of the ways I would identify that is if you go really strong in that black and white thinking, you're you're really talking about fundamentalism of some kind. And it's really interesting to try to leave that space because nothing is ever going to be as certain as absolute certainty. And the way that you belong to a group, the way that you seek out who you will, will align yourself with, every decision. If you feel like you have an answer for every single question of life and then you leave that, it's, it's just a really hard thing to because you're kind of like wired that way, you're indoctrinated that way, and then you're trying to find something else. And in some ways, you know, I'm choosing a lot of things that are very different than how I was raised, but it is a struggle to even look at parts of myself and parts of my history and say, like, I don't have an answer for that, but that I'm doing this on purpose. Um, and to fall back into a black and white certainty feeling feels safe, you know? Okay, so I want to start just so everyone can see because <laughs> I want to started? get back. This is so good. This is so good. Um, because some of those things were right. And so how do I'm you just going make by. sense. And some of, of them were wrong. And how do you make where where do you go to it? So just brief overview. So, so, and then we, we can, by the way, this is a conversation <laughs> so we can swim back in sure. and out of whatever, but just to for someone that doesn't know your story, um, just get whatever, whatever yeah. five, 10 minute version of your story. And then we can swim back in through all the channels because there's so sure. much. And, yeah. So I am the oldest of 12 kids and I was raised homeschooled all the way through um, learning arts and different things from a pretty young age. And when I was around um, 15, 16, started performing with my family. My dad kind of urged us that way. Um, my brother, some of my different siblings were like really talented. I was really drawn to writing, expressing, um, composing, reading, and and all of that. So I really gravitated towards that, did a lot of the writing for what became our band. Um, and so I played fiddle, was the lead singer. And this is just a real crunchy summary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get back but to it. But yeah, I was I was in that environment um till I was uh, just about 24. Um, we were on TV and um there are a lot of kind of happy, beautiful things on the outside, but they're going all the way back to the beginning with some like really toxic threads throughout the story as well. My dad was really abusive um, from my very earliest memories. And if you can think of a type of abuse, that was probably on the table. He was sexually abusive. Um, he became violent, especially towards the end, physically abusive. Um, there was religious and financial abuse, all kinds of stuff. But um, things just got so extreme that I really feel like I probably I was either going to die <laughs> inside that toxic system or I was going to get out and try to start over with a new life. And just like a snapshot of that time was being basically 24 years old, not having a phone, not having a car, not earning my own money, not able to have the relationships and friendships and the communication that I would have want. It added up to like a type of house arrest. And to leave my family was not just walking out the door. It was leaving the business, the religion, the almost like a cult. Um, and when I did get out, I got straight into um, trauma therapy. Um, I was supported in helping bring my dad to justice and he is convicted and he's serving time. And uh, I'm about five, six years now into a totally new life. And just this past year came back and reclaimed music um, as a solo artist, put out a record where all the songs are straight from processing my story and then also put out a memoir at the end of last year, which really is saying all the things that I never said for what now is kind of 30 years of a, of a very strange kind of life um, because it was really strange to be out there, to be public, to be speaking, to be using my voice, but it not to be a true story, true to my mm -hmm. experience. Um, and to just in some ways, it feels like now I'm actually able to begin, <laughs> you know, yeah. just getting started. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. By the way, you're, you're just being here. You're, I, you're amazing. And I, I, I hate the word. We overused the word brave. It just made it this really. We overuse a lot stupid of Stupid word. <laughs> brave. 
you really are. I mean, it, it's you. that the I had idea... a lot of support. That's the thing. It's like there's so many parts in the story. And, and I we try figured to... out that my friend Al Andrews had a place in giving you information to help. I mean, which there's is, one example. It's like God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves, which is um, <clears throat> there's like a million questions that I, I would or would want to ask. And I'll, I'll forget most of them probably. But starting wherever you wherever you feel comfortable. Have you read the book Educated? Okay, so. So I had a lot of people recommend that book to me when it first came out. They were like, this sounds like kind of like your story. And I resonated so hard. Yeah, so. With so many things in that story. And it was, I would say, like that book and others like it were instrumental in helping me feel the bravery and the inspiration and the permission to speak my story because you resonate with all the things that are similar, but then the things that are different stand out. Um, and what I appreciated in particular before I leave the topic of that specific book is I was so impressed, so thankful that Tara Westover, the author, was articulating things that I really struggled to make other people understand. Because when you have an upbringing that has the elements of um, being off the grid or having that fundamentalism or like a philosophy and or a religion that makes you other from everybody else. And then you try to leave that and assimilate and try to look back and make sense of what you've been given and what you want to take with you and what you want to let go. I just so resonated with that. And the book is both her childhood, but then her young adulthood making sense and getting herself an education because she decided she wanted that for herself. And I resonate with that as well. Interesting that half of the kids in that story got PhDs and the other half still work on the commune or whatever, it, you know, whatever you might want to call it. Um, it's, just, it's just interesting. I have, um, I mean, there's no, there's no handbook to parenting. There's a lot of things I don't know. And I would just still know, but what you suffered was something that's um, completely unspeakable and it's just evil. And, um, you know, your father or whatever, if Christian, so family? we were we were raised. I got the idea it was very fundamentalist Christian family. So we were raised with Christianity, and one of the ongoing things, like there's so much that I have processed, and in a really weird way, I really feel like the early childhood sexual abuse is the stuff that, while putting the disclaimer, I'll always be working on it. I have felt the most progress, and you know there were things that I just you could not get my mouth to move to say and just shake and everything and cry. And now I can speak about those things specifically if that's appropriate. And I feel so much strength, so much calm, and so much healing in that area. And I, I love that. And I want to celebrate that. There are still other areas that are much more rocky, much more confusing. And you know I'm still coming to terms, I think, with the role that religion played in my upbringing, in my abuse. And, you know, I do not shy away from talking specifically about some of the things that I've gone through, like in my book, for example. Um, and, you know, because my family was public to some degree, the arrest, the scandal, it, that was public to some degree. And you just want to hide under a rock and just run away from that. Um, but, you know, the part that was reported was that there were these crimes, there was these sexual crimes from childhood, my father, all those things. Um, but the part that I, in some sense, carry more shame around and is still so confusing is at 23, being in this toxic high control group of my family where religion was used as such an awful tool, like there's a scene in my book that I talk about and I go into great detail because I actually have a video of this incident, but my, I was being accused of being possessed by a demon for wanting to leave the house. And I was being made into the problem. Like my dad, who now in the story, we understand he's convicted. He did these things. He pled guilty to these things. Um, but go back just a couple chapters earlier in the story and dad was not being talked about as the problem. I was being talked about as the problem. And wanting to seek out independence or freedom, it was all framed as, well, you want to go choose sin in your life. You want, you know, you're selfish. You're trying to walk out of God's will. And in that particular instance, I would love to say that I just kind of went, ha ha, and laughed and like didn't participate 
or just like removed myself. But I was very much tied up in that. It's not that simple when it's all you know. No. It's not at all that simple. And I like in this particular scene, like I I remember I ended up saying just to try to get out of that situation, saying like, "Fine, Satan is my master. Can I go now?" And so like I wear that, and like that's a hard one to bring up <laughs> with people. But I want to be honest about like. <clears throat> Yeah, there's a lot to work through there still. And as far as the history with religion, my grandf- my dad's father um, was a Baptist pastor. As far as I understand, like not Southern Baptist, this is in Chicago. Um, there would have been a lot of like focus on the family growing up. Um, Dobson, John MacArthur, like those sorts of thought leaders on our bookshelves. Went to like the that. James Dobson, uh, whatever that, the Bill Gothard seminars, whatever. But yeah, J- all that. Yes. We were not Bill Gothard, but it's interesting to see how many other large family. You know, yeah. it's not always the same. James ten, Dobson was my mom's. So we used to say she had a crush on him, which she would have never had a crush on any <laughs> man at all. But James Dobson was her. Yeah, focus on the family was the yeah. ground zero for all information. So I, yeah, yeah. So there. That was very much the soil that our family plant was growing from. And then in fairness to all of those influences, there, my dad went in a direction that I personally think is a continuation of those, but the most, po- the most toxic possible version of it. Mm-hmm. You know, there were teachings that I think were handed down through our extended family, through some of those theology and preachers that um, unfortunately was used to like commit crimes and none of those people would ever have meant for that to happen. But I think there is some sort of through line that, you know, some things that you teach are um, a very dark kind of version of making a little victim, like grooming where you don't have, um, when you are told from day one that there is nothing good about you and you deserve every bad thing that happens to you. And particularly as a female child, um, you know, that the only valid role for you is to be happy, to never complain, to never talk back, to always obey. Where is the asterisk disclaimer of like, sometimes dads are not God and they aren't to be obeyed and they aren't to be. And who do you speak out to? the subservient mother who's there to always also obey and serve and and demur and like and then you seek out maybe somebody in the larger religious um hierarchy and then what if they're also extending on this um we eventually left um any sort of church and we were like home church where my dad was very much in control of us in our family so we eventually like left all I don't blame. I don't want to. I don't want to stop you because that's. It's, I can but ramble, I want to comment. So no, I this, no, no. It's, I just. I don't. I don't want to miss anything. But I also, like, I don't blame the church for for this necessarily. But there's something about it in in the maybe it's the focus on the family. To be honest, I've forgotten all this stuff. I just know James Dobson was my mom's dude or whatever. But. Um, the, the dad is never wrong, like all powerful. And anything you say is not submissive. And and there's a, a little bit that seeps through even, even into the people I see now when I go back home. The dad is always right. And what if he's not right? Like there's no, no, nothing, nothing, um, no allowance for the, the idea that dad might be an absolute sicko. And we have it. And so the dad's always right. And so even with a moderately healthy person, the dad is always right. And he says it, but the wife and the mother and the child, especially the female child has no say over really important things like, I don't know, what we do and where we live and how many kids we have and what our finances or whatever it might be. And it's just, um, it seeps through even to, to now, but I was kind of raised in that thing. You're, oh, you're, you're disrespectful, unsubmissive wife. My wife, my mom would have never questioned my dad um, for years. I think maybe as time went on, but it's a slippery slope because my dad was a good man. And so he, but, but, if he had not been a good man, it would have gone way far down the road before it would have been challenged. And I think you probably experienced that. I, I think, you know, the protest to saying, you know, this is bad, there's a problem here would be, well, we do talk about like every person is a sinner. Like there is, any person can choose wrong and can abuse authority and and all of that. And, um, you know, cause I've been asked like, why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you get help? Like, you know, you're taught morals you're taught that something's 
right and wrong and like didn't you know it was wrong um but i think to your point it gets really um like it's not a theoretical thing the lived experience is not always what people expect and you know especially for most of the thought leaders being the men who are the ones who are given the control they're thinking of it theoretically they're not they're not actually recalling lived experiences that they have and they want to see the system that they're laying out work well and i think you're correct in that it reminds me of the criticism of a monarchy versus like a republic or a democracy is like with a king if it's a good king great if it's a bad king you're in trouble because they're a tyrant and there's no check and balance and so we want to have a better system than that and having the family set up like a monarchy you're really at the you know and and i think again the the protestation would be well it's not supposed to be a monarchy it's you know you're you know a father shouldn't see themselves as power and this and that you know they're supposed to be a servant god is the one in control and they are the chief servant and that's just not how i've seen it modeled most of the time um and so you know i think for me just in general scooting back on religion and christianity being the religion that i was in the big tent of is that word means so many different things over thousands of years and just trying to throw out that disclaimer fairly early on when i'm talking to people is like we're going to be talking about a vast different lived experience using that same word and i just think that for me i'm not sure that i will always stay in the big tent of christianity but i'd really love to find a home there because there's some really beautiful things there it's my heritage it's my family a lot of my community lives there but there's some really toxic things inside this tent and i you know the only thing i know is that i can't stay with what i was raised with and what i was given cuz it's criminal and, and it's, it's fair wrong. that's not even just fair it's really fair with with you uh, i found god after years of fundamental evangelical uh culture in life, I became an alcoholic and a drug addict, and I found God in recovery and 12-step programs. And it's the same God. It's just we're all representing God the way we want to represent them, and we find information that supports what we already believe, and we pound that into ourselves. And it's good people all around, and then also bad people all around. But I think that when we use it as a weapon to hurt people by, no, 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 don't question this. Oh, I question everything. I question everything. I question politicians, leaders, rulers, everyone. And you can question me too. Feel free to. I think when we stop questioning things, we're in trouble. And someone has the ability to get really hurt when we go, oh, no, no, don't, don't, don't ask. Bullshit. Ask. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I was given a very strong version of don't, kind of don't, um, the weird thing is it was like question everyone else, but don't question me. So there's a very strong thread of hypocrisy there, of course. Um, and I think where I'm at is I'm, you know, it remains to be seen how um, I really have encountered a lot of things that I have absorbed and try to live my life by now. And a lot of that health and that clarity and that progress has come from some really great therapy that I've done. And that so many of the principles and like things that I've encountered and and taken with me directly clash with that really toxic version of um, like religion and, and belief. So for me, it's trying to make sense of like, it can't be that every human being is worthy of love and acceptance and we are nothing but worms and hell is too good for us. Like, you know, like how, how do you make sense of those things? And like, I love a good paradox. I love a good not but, but and. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's tough. <laughs> That's not God though. That's the crazy stuff. It's, it's so we we poor God, you know what what we what we brand him on. I don't know you know, if I've ever heard someone say poor, poor God. God. Like literally, he's like, oh, no, no, that's not me. That's not me. You don't don't we we paste God on things that he's not on, and we paste God on things we want to be true. And um, I, I mean, I it's funny because some of the people that would challenge that, that I that I'm close to that would challenge me on my lack of dogma. I would like for them to sit down and talk to you and then try to try to say, because there's something about that evangelical fundamentalism somewhere in there. I'm not saying that it it is wrong or it's 
but that gives permission for things to happen like what happened to you. Um, somehow the dad is all powerful. Somebody raised your mom to think that she had to be subservient too. That probably goes back another generation. Would you agree? I mean, why? Would, I, when did your I'm mom start being interested. subservient? I, I think there's quite a bit that I have looked into and, and found out about, you know, um, cause it doesn't happen in a vacuum and problems didn't start when I popped up on the scene. Um, but yeah, having empathy for, um, understanding that my dad was once a child. There were things that were confusing to him. Um, we all have experiences that can lead us to become the worst versions of ourselves or invite us into becoming that better, healthier version. And I do think that both of my parents, um, were, were given things that, um, either set them up for challenges or left them without the tools that they needed. I, you know, I view my dad as, um, he'll always be my dad, <laughs> you know, biologically, but he'll never get to be my dad, my daddy, my, you know, um, and that will never feel right. And for many years I stayed one of the many, many complicated answers to why did you stay? How did this happen? Is that, you know, at the core, I still wanted a father that was going to love me. The things that I was, whether I was told or not, some part of us knows that we should be loved and we should be protected and, and cared for. And it was really hard to realize in my early 20s that, you know, speaking up or getting out wasn't going to make me lose the father that I had. Like, I'd never had him. He'd never been there. Um, and I had been giving more and more chances and trying to offer love and fealty and all these things to an abuser, a criminal, you know, and someone who is a human and deserves the love and empathy and respect that we give to every human, but also needs to be treated accurately in reality, um, not the hopeful ideal dream that we like all have. So mourning that and letting go of that was part of that process and, and leaving and to look at my mom and to believe be the best in her and to want to see her happy and to want to try to protect her in a weird way. I felt for so many years that I was somehow trying to protect my mom and even up until releasing my Why not book, blowing up the, the Yes and no. Like Situation. I talk about pretty early, one of the first little stories that I share in my book as a kid being three, four, you know, some of my earliest memories, um, being a f realizing that my mom was afraid for dad to come home. I don't, I can't remember the specifics. I was certainly not briefed on the entire situation, but to see the person that cared for me, took care of me when I was sad and crying and needed help and to have an adult who would have been in her early twenties at that time with three or four kids already, you, yeah. you know, um, and for her to see without her saying, I am afraid for dad to come home, to see you her know. crying, to see her distressed and to go, wait a second, there is something wrong with the structure. Mom takes care of dad. Moms take care of all, all those kids. Who takes care of mom? Like mom, there's something wrong with the structure and feeling like I have to try to do it. I can't, but you're always set up to fail as a child because you're trying to save the person that you're dependent on. And so it makes you not feel like the child. It gets in the way of your relationship. And, you know, my mom tried so hard to keep us from the fullness of her. Like, there's still so many things she's not told me and I'll never know. Um, but it was something that I felt and that I internalized. And flashing forward all these decades later, telling my mom, like, mom, I have to tell my story and my truth. And I realized that standing in the way of my healing and my purpose is this idea that I'm still trying to protect you from the story that we all live, we all know, but like, I'm trying to participate in this rewriting of, of history and preserving of like, you know, not facing the fullness of this and to have to say that's on you and this is on me. Like we each have to do our own work and um, code word there being codependency and enmeshment. Like there was a lot of that with my family. And that is kind of a type of sobriety that I have to try to maintain is it'll always be there. The pull of kind of toxic 
dependency and enmeshment to try to not do that with any of my family members is still sometimes a great challenge. I can imagine. I mean, it's, it's funny. I usually start these things with a, with a quote and I forgot about the, Ooh, but it's funny that the quote, quote is, uh, it's so funny what you just said. The, the quote I have, and I, I don't even have the, the, the credit on who, who said it, but truth is vital, but without love, it is unbearable. Mm-hmm. And I, when you were saying, I went, oh, I forgot my quote because the truth for your mom was unbearable without some for support system. Us, for yeah. Right. So, but I mean, as a protector of you, because there's got to be some part of you that were like, mom, what the hell? You let me, it sounds like your mom was also a victim. Absolutely. In my opinion. Yes. And yeah. like, it's interesting for me because I'm being open about my story in a way that I think a lot of people aren't given the chance to, or aren't given the support to. It's not like I'm somehow smart or brave or anything. It's like, I'm given the opportunity to do this. And it feels like a really wholly an important responsibility. Um, so that disclaimer. Um, and like you said before, your, your transgressor is in jail. So you have the, f- it's a different sort of opportunity. Freedom to like, and, yeah. So yeah. Um, but I was, I was going to say something about that quote, but just, yeah, being honest about the story I think is, is really crucial. And if we can't do that, it's like when you have a map, And you know how it'll say, like, you are here? Well, if you're given the wrong, you are here, how are you supposed to navigate? Like, you have to take stock. And that sounds so simple, but it is so challenging. And we have to do it over and over and over. And the gap, we use the word delusion, like when someone thinks the way things are, like they're living in a fantasy world. And to some degree, that's what you have to do to survive things like this. And so when it comes to like my mom or commenting on anybody in my family, I just really want to say like, I'm trying to just speak for myself. I mean, I've written a whole book, but I really try not to um, speak for anyone else really. But I, I can talk about how through my eyes, like seeing my mom, seeing my dad, seeing my story unfold, I think that my viewpoint is valid and I can share that if I want or not. So. Yeah. Well, your and your truth exposes the whole thing. Cause there's no way to go, well, that happened to her, but it didn't happen because everyone was there. And so yeah. th- there's a certain amount of, of this that I'm sure sits on your mother because she's like, Oh, this happened to my daughters. And, and I didn't, wasn't able to protect them, but that, well, what I can, I can talk my own version of that. You know, I have, I'm one of 12 things were happening to me. And these other precious young humans weren't even born. You know, this talk about something predating you. And, you know, when I come to, whether it be my mother, my father, anybody, when I have anger, when I have betrayal, when I have blame that I'm, you know, I'm trying to make sense of something, I have to be really honest and look at the period in my story where I think other people in a valid way, could look at me and go, you had what you needed, but you didn't do what you should have done. And I think that when other people say that to us, that's so hard, because how do you let that in? Like, it's so, that's so vulnerable. That's so, that's the hardest thing you could possibly hear. But I do want in my own way to face that because I want to not be that, that I want to make a different decision now. If I want to grow past the person who hid, I talk, uh, there's a scene in my book where um, I call them in the dark ages, like those mm. few months before I left that were so hard where I was trying to like stand up for myself, but it was in the most devastating way possible, probably for my family, because my sanity was like going bit by bit. I was getting crazier and crazier because I, I just wasn't removing. There's no way to fix a system. You remove yourself from it. So when you're trying to like protest and stay in it, it just deteriorates so quickly. And we were in the bus and um, my dad told me to apologize and I did not. We were, it was kind of an argument, kind of, he was like disciplining me and um, he hit me in the face, um, which he hadn't really done that before. And he pulled the bus over, he was driving, he pulled the bus over, he was like pulling me by my hair. It got like, it got so scary. And all of my siblings were in there and my mom and it was just chaos and screaming and like all of this stuff. I was like bleeding and a police car had seen the bus pull over and the policeman came to the door and nobody had to even say anything to me that I remember anyway. I just went and like hid in my bus because I knew how to put a smile on my face, but I couldn't out smile like the blood and the 
bruising that was probably happening at that point. And as I was sitting there hiding, I felt like the small child who needed someone to come save her. But I was very aware that I was like in an adult's body. And it was like, I'm still waiting for permission to accept this is really happening. And no one's going to stop it. I didn't even stop it. And here's help at the door. And I, it is not within me to reach for that. Like it's never going to get easier than it is in this split second. And so I was just wondering like, am I ever going to get out? If I haven't left yet, am I going to die? Is this going to escalate so quickly that, you know, that, and that was the darkest moment for me. How, how I didn't want to be alive. How long after that did you actually get out then? So that was probably either January, it was like between November or January, somewhere in that winter. In the book, at some point I had nailed down the exact date because I knew what gigs it was between. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was on stage a couple days later um, in Nashville <laughs> for a conference. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I left in April, so it was still a number of months. And it, it I would say it got worse from there. Um, so I think that's the part that I was speaking earlier about, like, there was some amount of scandal and, oh, this, this father did this. And eventually um, I spoke and some of my other sisters and siblings spoke about, you know, this being our story. And um, I think that was the part that I was still wearing, even up until the release of this book was like, there are still so many parts of the story that feel unspeakable. And like, it's so shameful to admit, but it's because I'm admitting like how bad I let it get before I left. It's crazy. It starts so early. To 